nine days ago, Canada became the first, and so far only, G7 country to legalize cannabis for adult recreational use. Now, Canadians aren't ones to boast, but the decision to leave behind decades of outdated status quo thinking is groundbreaking. I still don't think we fully realize the paradigm shifting nature of this decision, but its impact and implications will be far reaching. From the way in which it'll affect our criminal justice system, to medical science, and to the emergence of an entirely new legal industry, and to the jobs, innovation, and opportunity that it will bring with it. Now I understand there are a lot of concerns, and there's no question some of these are legitimate, and they will need to be addressed. But much of the alarm, in particular to those of us who may never have known cannabis as anything other than an illicit illegal substance only to be obtained from a dealer on a dark corner, is frankly grounded in irrational fear. In my view, it's really no different from any other societal norm which has changed over time. We look back now and wonder how things really ever could have been any other way. I mean, think about it. It wasn't that long ago that we were able to smoke on airplanes, on trains, buses, in restaurants, even in our places of work. And it seems almost inconceivable now, but that was the status quo. When I first started working in the early 90s, I still had a few older colleagues who would smoke in our dictation room right next to the resuscitation bay. I mean, stop and think about this for a moment. At that time as well in Ontario, it was illegal to shop on Sundays, and alcohol was something you could only buy from the government. Oh, wait a minute, that's, uh, <laughs> that's still the case. But, of course, this is a relic. It's a holdover from a century ago when alcohol was banned in Ontario. Prohibitionists at the time argued that due to high blood pressure, alcoholics were at risk of spontaneously combusting. It's true. They also believed that less spending on alcohol would lead to more spending in other areas of the economy. Of course, neither prediction came to pass, and we look back now, and they both sound rather ridiculous. I believe that in time, we will look back at the same fear and stigma which has long censured cannabis with the same cooler, more rational eye. But we're not quite there yet. And I understand because it took me some time to get there myself. Today I'd like to share with you my journey as a medical doctor, now supportive of the clinical use of cannabis, and also discuss with you an issue that many employers are grappling with, cannabis in the workspace. So let me tell you how I got there. I began my career about 25 years ago as an emergency room doctor. Yes, that is uh, me up there. <laughs> Clearly some of us remain ageless. 80% of people who show up in the ER do so with what we call undifferentiated pain. And according to the latest statistics, a shocking one in five Canadians suffer from the condition of chronic pain. And it's 20%. Chronic pain is sometimes referred to as the invisible epidemic. It affects millions of Canadians, no doubt many of you in this room today. It's your fathers, your grandmothers suffering from chronic back pain or an arthritic hip. It was this awareness of the growing impact and societal burden of chronic pain that led me to want to become involved in managing these patients years ago. And as a backdrop to this, it's important to understand that in the late 90s and early 2000s, opiates were being aggressively marketed to doctors as safe for the long-term treatment of chronic pain. Like the majority of my colleagues, I drank some of this Kool-Aid and with the very best of intentions, started using it more liberally to treat some of my worst pain patients, and certainly initially many did get better. Cannabis as a treatment option for chronic pain, I mean, that wasn't something that most of my colleagues accepted, and certainly like the majority, I too was skeptical and had bought into the long-standing stigma. But two things changed my mind. The first was the devastation that the overprescribing of opiates began to reveal now well over a decade ago. I and mean, we've all seen the headlines, rising death rates year after year, with no apparent end in sight. And again, last year, a new record. This in spite of aggressive directives from government and professional associations alike to curb their use. The second thing that changed my mind is that patients and their families started coming to me, asking me to prescribe medical cannabis, not just to treat their pain, but also to help manage suffering in their loved ones. 
One such patient is a young woman by the name of Deanna Molinaro, a budding artist from Hamilton. Deanna is 26 years old and has suffered her entire life from a rare genetic disorder called dystrophic epidermolosis bullosa, or EB. EB is a condition that causes the layers of skin to separate with even the mildest of trauma or friction. Simply hugging someone with EB can cause trauma equivalent to that of a third degree burn. As a result of this, most EB patients suffer tremendously from constant sores that typically lead to the tethering fusion and eventual loss of fingers, toes, and even limbs. 90% of Deanna's body is covered in sores that require the often excruciating full body dressing changes every other day. As you can well imagine, like most EB patients, Deanna also relied heavily on round the clock painkillers. But some time ago, Deanna decided to try and wean herself off the opiates and replace them mostly with medical cannabis oil. She now reports improved pain control, improved alertness, less brain fog, and she feels more in the moment during the daytime when she needs to be for her classes and her artwork. And she sleeps better at night when she needs the rest. As you can all tell, Deanna lost her left lower arm some time ago and uses special techniques to hold on to her instruments and brushes for her artwork. Yet Deanna is determined to not let her disease conquer her, to have a quality of life and to pursue the passion that she loves. The middle frame above me is a painting that was commissioned by her cousin Justin of his young son. It's just spectacular. And there are many, many stories like Deanna's and a burgeoning body of evidence to suggest the efficacy of medical cannabis, not just in treating chronic pain, but other conditions as well. Things such as anxiety, insomnia, inflammation, wound healing. Yet there remains pushback and resistance, including corners of the medical community. The Canadian Medical Association, for example, while finally acknowledging the benefit of cannabis in treating end-stage chronic disease and terminal illness, still feel that on balance, the risk-benefit data are lacking. Yet overall, there appears to be a general increased acceptance, slowly but surely, of cannabis-based medicines. We're starting to see major insurers providing coverage for cannabis, and large companies and organizations such as Layuna, Loblaws, Opsu, and others are including it on their health benefit plans. Which brings me to one of the most critical points I want to get across to you today and that's to distinguish between the recreational and medical use of cannabis. This is so important for companies to understand as they look to update their workplace policy to include directives on cannabis and potential impairment issues. The obvious challenge lies in finding the balance between a patient's right to medication while ensuring a safe workplace. The critical determinant of this balance lies in how the cannabis is being used. When cannabis is being used recreationally, it's simple. The purpose is to use as much as needed in order to get high or become intoxicated. That's your end point. When cannabis is used medicinally, truly medicinally, the purpose is to use as little as possible to manage the symptoms with the specific end point of not getting high. Literally the exact opposite. Second of all, not all cannabis is the same. Not all cannabis will get you high. Let me explain. The cannabis plant contains cannabinoids, just like we make in our own bodies. And they are, in fact, critical to our survival, so much so that we pass them on in breast milk. All cannabinoids, whether made by plants or by us, act on the same receptors in our brains and bodies. The two most important plant cannabinoids are THC and CBD. THC, of course, is the one that can get you high and tends to be found in higher concentrations in a joint. CBD will not get you high. For example, I use CBD predominant medications to treat soccer moms and countless elderly patients, retired accountants, shopkeepers, grandparents. They get up in the morning, they take their medicine, they drive their cars around town, engage in their daily activities with reduced pain and an improved quality of life. They're not high. THC predominant formulation should be reserved for non-working hours and evenings, for things such as sleep and anxiety, while CBD predominant formulations can be safely used during the day 
to manage symptoms of pain and inflammation and other things. There's a well-accepted phenomenon or concept in the field of chronic pain management known as the pain triad, the three pillars of which are pain, insomnia, and emotional distress. The basic premise is that all three can affect each other either negatively or positively and bidirectionally. So for example, when sleep is compromised, this tends to heighten emotional distress and it worsens chronic pain. Conversely, if pain is lessened or managed, sleep generally improves, etc. So one of the th really exciting things about cannabis-based medicine is that you have the potential to intervene positively at all three pillars with medicine derived from this just one plant. Cannabis-based medications have the potential to reduce or entirely eliminate many dangerous strong drugs that we currently use to treat pain, insomnia, and anxiety. Drugs which are factually more addictive, sedating, and potentially life-threatening. And frankly, more dangerous for abuse in the workplace. Yet they are all covered on everyone's benefit plans. Lawmakers, teachers, police officers, healthcare professionals, and all the workers who have assembled every single car that will be driving you home today. And as we've recently learned, even the TTC subway drivers. So with that in mind, I'd like to talk about some of the things that should be considered when designing a workplace cannabis policy. I've had the opportunity to speak at a number of conferences to insurers of workplace health plans, benefit providers, and plan sponsor groups to large companies and organizations. And the one thing that I always get asked, I get asked this every single time I talk, what do we do if someone shows up to work high? To which I reply, well, what are you doing right now if someone shows up drunk? I would reprimand them exactly the same way. It's important to bear in mind that while there are clear requirements surrounding the duty to accommodate, employers are neither expected nor required to accommodate impaired or intoxicated employees, ever. Any new or updated workplace policy in this uh, post-pot legal world should include a clear definition of substance abuse, what employers consider to be impairment, and smoking policy, which includes cannabis. Moreover, any existing policy addressing prescription drug use should include medical cannabis. Employees need to feel that they can confidentially report when use any, using any substance that may be causing impairment and under what circumstances medical cannabis and non-medicinal substances are allowed. And finally, a provision needs to be in place to help all employees suffering from any form of substance dependence. Medical cannabis in the workplace is not to be feared. Rather, through clear and concise policy, its thoughtful and responsible introduction should be embraced. I began my talk by noting that we're now living in a world where cannabis is legal and conceding, too, that not enough is fully yet known about the potential of medical cannabis. Stigma persists, and we need to address this through education. And to be clear, we need more studies. But we do already know the potential for cannabis to displace many more patently dangerous drugs, drugs which are killing Canadians right now in droves. And these drugs are being used largely with impunity on job sites and in workplaces, covered on everyone's benefit plans and thus tacitly accepted as safe. This is absurd, and it is just so hypocritical. There has never been one single documented fatality from a cannabis overdose. Not one. A smoker would be required to consume almost 1,500 pounds of cannabis in a 15-minute window to induce a lethal toxicity. 1,500 pounds. And now consider this. A recent study looking at the association between cannabis legalization and workplace fatality published in the International Journal of Drug Policy, done in the US, found that in all 29 states where a medical cannabis framework was in place, worker fatalities dropped by almost 
in all workers aged 25 to 44. Deanna and countless other genuine medical cannabis patients just like her are not seeking to get high. They're looking to manage their symptoms safely and have an improved quality of life. They're looking to get better. And this is what should frame our discourse around sound workplace policy. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That was great.